Okay, part two here. Welcome to It's Getting Better All the Time, Mental Health Outreach with your host, Sister Ayla Gray, providing information and support while encouraging hope and faith. You can log on to our website at igbatt.com or you can, our other website at igbattmho.org. And I'm wearing my t-shirt today. When I came on, maybe you could see it. It's called Make Hope an Option. And that's what we want to talk about today, is the importance hope of hope. As the, those of you who watch us know that uh, it's getting better all the time. Mental health outreach is a faith-based um, program providing information and support. We talk about mental health topics, mental health issues from both a faith perspective as well as a clinical perspective. I am a clinical social worker. Um, my other colleagues are also elders, ministers, and we come together and we just talk about mental health from various um, sides of the fence, if you will. Because I do, I recognize the important role that faith and hope has in so many of our lives, including mine, but I also understand that it may not be the case for everyone. But so we want to just talk about it from both sides of the fence. So when we talk about um, the role of hope and faith, what I wanted to talk about is start off talking about, about suicide death by suicide, and then we're going to get into probably, I'll probably break it up when we talk about what's called the spirit of heaviness. Let's talk about suicide. The term has changed a few years ago. We now say death by suicide, um, but suicide is the intentional, is when a person intentionally takes their life. This is January 24th, and those of you who are <coughs> in America um, heard about that we had a, a famous celebrity, her only son actually took his life, I guess, over the weekend. So some of you may be aware of, of that story. I can tell you I have a, um, an, uh, unfortunately, a couple of people. A friend of mine just a few months ago, her son also died by suicide. So it's a common, it's more common than we might think. Unfortunately, you know, I try to explain this to people, especially from a spiritual standpoint, you got to realize that we're spirit, soul, and body. The body, you know, is able to get sick. So sometimes the body will do things and overwhelm us, like for example, cancer, <coughs> um, getting a cold, flu, this types of stuff. This is all part of the body. It's not part of your spiritual aspect. So you can be saved, love Jesus, and still catch a cold. It's the same way with any other mental um, illness, because again, when we talk about mental illnesses, we're talking about brain illnesses. But let me kind of go through my slide here for a class that I put together. Um, let's talk about suicide. People will ask the question, well, why did the person kill himself? Did they lose their job? Were they, um, were they homeless? Were they, uh, you know, uh, kicked out? Did they have to live on the streets? Um, did they lose all their money? What is it? Well, the thing is, you and I know people, <coughs> I'm sorry, you and I know people who are homeless, who got kicked out of their house, who were in jail, who lost everything, <coughs> excuse me, who don't even think about suicide. So it's other factors, it's not just one cause. We know that there is no single cause of suicide. It most often occurs when stresses exceed current coping abilities or someone suffering from a mental health condition. So sometimes a person may have a diagnosed or undiagnosed um, mental health condition, and sometimes they may not. <coughs> you may be able to point to a particular reason. Um, excuse me. Forgive me, I'm not sure what happened just there, just now, but anyway, there's no single cause of suicide. It most often occurs when stressors exceed current coping abilities of someone suffering from a mental health condition. And a lot of times when a person is, dies by suicide, they are dealing with depression, but it's not always the case. So you don't want to just say, you know, go around thinking because a person is depressed, then yeah, you must be, you're going to be suicidal. That's not necessarily the case. However, we do see it a lot. <coughs> How we do see it a lot. So, just kind of keep that 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 in mind. Um, so, there's no one single cause to suicide, death by suicide. I can tell you that when a person, from talking to people who attempted suicide and were unsuccessful, we know that when a person gets to that point, it 
they, they see no other option, they see no other um, way out, that sometimes they feel like they are a burden. Um, I don't know if you've ever felt, um, just had this thought that come across your mind, say things are not going well for me, um, I, life will be better without me, I don't have anything to offer anyone. You know, sometimes we can get there in these thoughts. I always say thoughts, feelings, and behaviors go together. And we have to be careful of the things that we tell ourselves and things that we think. Well, sometimes when you especially when you're, you're depressed, because when we talk about being clinically depressed, when I talk about, um, let me just say this, there's a difference between clinically depressed and just being quote unquote depressed. Many people use the term depressed uh, to explain their feelings, let's say if I lost my job or um, I don't have any money in the bank, or I'm depressed. Well, I'm depressed I can, it's as a, because of a situation. When you talk about clinical depression, a person can hit the lottery and still be down. They can still be depressed. So clinical direct de depression, we're talking about biologically based. We're talking about changes um, that are as a result within the body, okay? So we're talking about something that, that's a little different. I think the confusion comes in is that a lot of people like using that term depressed really means they're not depressed per se, uh, clinically depressed, but they're just, that's just a term that, that we use. Uh, so let me move on here. <coughs> what leads to suicide? As I said before, and I'm going to read this from my slides that I put together. We will eventually have these on our, some stuff is on our website. Please go to IGBATT.com or IGBATTMHO.org and you can get information that it will take you to the other national organizations. This slide show we will eventually have on our website. We're having some um, challenges with our website, so we have to um, redo some things. But hopefully I can get this on there without causing too much problems. But what leads to suicide? As I said, there's no single cause for suicide. Suicide most often occurs, and I'm repeating this again, when stressors and health issues can converge to create an experience of hopelessness and despair. Depression is the most common condition associated with suicide and it is often undiagnosed or untreated. Conditions like depression, anxiety, and substance problems, especially when undressed, unaddressed, increase risk of suicide. So when you talk about, one, there's no one particular cause, um, what it can put a person in a higher risk for suicide, we know untreated depression, because a lot of times people are clinically depressed and they may not even realize it, right? Because you've been dealing with this for so long, you've been dealing with your emotions for so long, you just get used to trying to make it, right? You don't realize that time has gone on and as time, you know, it's, it's like you start out at the, um, at one point and you have like a hundred marbles in your bag, right? And as you keep walking, you don't realize that you're dropping mar marbles along the way. And that's what happens sometimes with untreated clinical depression. I'm talking about, again, untreated or poorly treated clinical depression is that people don't realize that they're dropping, they're losing strength along the way. You know, things that used to bring you joy, you know, less and less, you know, used to like going out, less and less, you know, changes are happening in your body and you're not doing the things that you, you used to do. Because what happens is you're just trying to make it through the day, you're just trying to make it through the night. You know, uh, as I always like to share on this broadcast, I know there are different people who are listening to me. There are those of you who have never dealt with uh, mental illness or clinically um, biologically based mental illness um, there's so, or depression. Some of you have been sad, because I think we've all been sad or depressed, if you will, in relation to an event. I have family members. I have people who are, like I said, who live with depression every day. So I try to kind of say something to everybody uh, who may be listening to me. So this one, what I'm going to say, you know, for those of you who don't know what it's like, I can tell you on behalf of our brothers and sisters who deal with clinical depression, there are times when they may not feel like getting up out of the bed. Again, if you were able to get up out of the bed and you, well, I was sad I got out of the bed, well, maybe you're not clinically depressed. I'm not talking to you or about you. I'm talking right now on behalf of the people who are clinically depressed. Now, people say, well, what, what about the role of hope and faith? It's hope and faith. It's Jesus Christ that's getting the person through the night. Sometimes all you have to get through the night um, is 
is nothing but the, um, Jesus Christ. You don't even know how you made it through the night. There are many people, as we talk right now, um, are thinking about dying by suicide because they see no other option. I wanted to come and talk about this particular topic today because of what happened in the news and because um, someone that many of us follow, um, a movie star, like I said, her son died by suicide. And what happens is when it happens like that to someone famous, if you will, and it's, the news starts talking about it, people start talking about it, people become triggered. Especially in January during this time of the year, there are a lot of people, you know, who have, have family members who died by suicide. A lot of people who thought about dying by suicide or taking their own lives. And when you start hearing this, it can kind of trigger you. It kind of make you feel you know, take you back to the place of where you were before. And I just want to kind of let you know that we got to always remember, we got to make hope an option. Hope is always an option. Hope in Jesus Christ is always the way to go, okay? But let me talk about here again what leads to suicide. No single cause. Many times a person is undiagnosed uh, or uh, untreated or poorly treated depression and they don't even realize it, right? One thing about depression, um, and we'll, we'll talk about, I guess, more as we go on, but as we talk, talk about depression, one of the things that it does, is talking about thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, you get tunnel vision. You start thinking um, a certain way, you start feeling a certain way, behaving a certain way, and you don't see the goodness or the things that's going around uh, around you. All you can focus on are the bad things. All you can focus on are the, the negative things. That's all you can you can focus on, okay? So remember, um, untreated conditions or poorly treated like depression, anxiety, and substance problems can put a person, can be a risk factor, okay? I use the term, I told you we don't say kill themselves anymore. We usually try to say um, or, or suicide. We use died by suicide or completed suicide. Those are the terms that you'll hear. Okay, let me talk about some suicide warning signs. Um, something to look out for when concerned that a person may be suicidal is a change in behavior or the presence of entirely new behaviors. So if you knew someone that was really down or depressed or whatever and you start seeing some changes, you might know that this can be, you know, something that you want to talk about. Right, or ask the person questions about. So change in one of the following. Their thoughts, which is manifested in their words, feelings, behaviors. All of a sudden they're happy and, ex you know, happy and excited, that you, you know, which is great, but you want to have a conversation. Or you notice they start pulling away. Because many times people will make their decision um, before they actually do it. So they'll make the decision and they may start giving away things. They may start, um, you know, kind of, um, visiting people. Um, my uncle, he, he went, before he died, he would ma he made sure that everybody, he was sending money to different people, right? Um, and then sometimes there is no, um, it, it, it seems to come from out of nowhere, but when you go back and take a look at it, you find that it really didn't. It was just some things, some signs that were there that we, we just didn't see. Um, so thoughts, feelings, and behaviors when we talk about different changes, right? Um, who's at risk? Who's at risk? Again, these are just some things to look out for. These are no, no hard, fast rules. Um, people who made a prior attempt, right? People who made a prior attempt uh, to death by suicide. Depression and other mental health disorders. Like I said, a person who has depression or other mental health disorders is at a higher risk for suicide doesn't mean that they will. Because there are plenty of people, there are many people who are clinically depressed, who are diagnosed with clinically de um, depression um, in, our med med uh, in our medications or getting treatment and they're doing well. Um, substance abuse, okay? Um, family history of mental health or substance abuse. Family history of suicide, okay? Family violence, access to firearms, medical illness, ages 15 to 24 or over 60. Men are more likely to die by suicide. Women are more likely to attempt. Okay, and men tend to be more lethal. Okay, um, we're seeing an increase in children, um, um, death by suicide. So just kind of keep that that in mind. Okay, let me keep going. I want to share some things here with you. 
Many, most people who have a risk factors for suicide will not kill themselves. So keep that in mind. Just because a person has a risk factor doesn't mean that they're going to kill themselves. I know many times some people get up concerned when you see your kids, um, you know, dressing all in black and writing these kind of odd poetry, and you get concerned. And I'm not saying you know you want to have a conversation, but it doesn't mean that they're going to kill themselves. People who attempt may react to events, think, and make decisions differently than those who do not attempt suicide. Um, depression is most commonly associated with suicide, not always the case, okay? Um, but in at least 50% of the cases, depression was, was there. Those suffering from depression are at 25 times greater risk for suicide than the general population. So again, suicide is something that you, we kind of want to pay uh, attention to. I mean, depression is something that we want to pay attention to, okay? Some warning signs. Talking about wanting to die or to kill themselves. I don't know, there's this myth that people think that people who are going to kill themselves, they don't talk about it. And that's not true. Sometimes they do talk about it. Um, or, because we think, oh, they just want attention. Even as, if that's the case, they just want attention, then we want to make sure we give it to them. Because there's something else that's going on with them. Um, looking for a way to kill themselves, like searching online or buying a gun. And I talked about this, um, I think, in the last post that I did, uh, when I was actually looking at the song that Rod Wave, one of the, um, for many of you don't know him, uh, Rod Wave, a, a famous rapper, did. And it was a song, Nirvana, that I thought was um, really spoke to uh, was suicide, I'm not saying he's suicidal, but some of the things that happen when you're dealing with for a young person. And one of the things I pointed out is that especially with a young person, they may not, uh, they may do things that appear to be reckless. So you have to have a conversation with them. Drive real fast. They may um, jump in front of a bus, or they may um, t mix these different drinks together and just do different stuff that may not look like. They may not go get a gun, okay? They may not take sleeping pills. They may do other things. So you just can't, um, you got to ask. Looking for a way to kill themselves. Uh, talking about feeling hopeless or having no reason to live. When a person starts talking about feeling hopeless, helpless, hopeless, um, that's when we definitely need to kind of have a conversation, okay? Um, talking about feeling trapped or in unbearable pain. And that's what a lot of people who are dealing with suicide, um, Talk about they talk about the pain of suicide. You know, mental illness, untreated mental health. Let me look at this real quick. Okay, um, hurts. Okay, it hurts you physically. Okay, um, you know, as far as the the, the tension, um, and it hurts it hurts you spiritually um, because spiritually you don't feel like doing anything, and it also can hurt you um, mentally as well. So it hurts you in all different. Um, aspects, okay? So just kind of keep that in mind when, when we're talking about um, untreated mental illness, okay? It, it's so important. Okay, let me go back to my slide here. Increasing the use of alcohol drugs, acting anxious or agitated, behaving recklessly, sleeping too little or too much. Again, the key word is change. Withdrawing or isolating themselves, showing rage or talking about seeking revenge, extreme mood swings, okay? So what do you do if you're, you're concerned with someone? One of the things that I talked about here before is you want to ask them. You, you want to kind of go up to the person and say, hey, I'm noticing, okay? I'm noticing, you know, that you haven't been sleeping well. I'm noticing that you, you know, you seem sad. Whatever you're noticing about the individual, are you okay? Okay. Um, you you want to just ask the person. You want to first say, "This is what I'm noticing. This is the change that I'm noticing in you." Blah 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 blah. blah. And because you want to give them an opportunity, you don't want to say, you know, um, accuse them of something that's not there. But you want to ask them, and then they might. And if they say, "Yeah, you know, I've been feeling kind of down or whatever," you. This is where you want to come out and ask. Well, are you thinking about killing yourself? Are you thinking about harming yourself? You want to ask the person, especially if you know the person is dealing with. Um, 
mental illness. The person may look kind of depressed or kind of sad. You're not really sure. If you know the person's family history, they have a lot of changes in their family, or you just have any concern. It is not true. It is a myth. People like to think, well, if you ask them, it'll put that in their mind. That's not true. Many times people are asking. I mean, they're hoping that somebody would ask. Because by you asking, it opens the door for them to share their feelings, to share what's going on in their mind. It helps them to feel like they're not alone. It can help the person to feel as if, you know, well, somebody cares, but it kind of gives them license. It's, it, so many people think about suicide or dying by suicide, but it's such a taboo topic that people don't even talk about it. There are many people who preach in the pulpit, who talk about Jesus, who have thoughts of killing themselves. You know, the, it fleets. You know, it's, it's not doesn't stay. Some people it stays longer than others. But the thing is, by you asking them that question, it opens the door. It allows them the opportunity to, to for you guys to talk about it. Okay, and then once they say yes, then there are certain things you want to do. You need to determine, okay, is this a right away thing or not a right away thing, or, or not a, r a right away thing. No more. You don't need to panic. Okay, you don't want to ask the question like you don't want them to really answer it. Okay, um, you don't want to say, you're not thinking about killing yourself, are you? Oh, come on, you know, don't do that. You don't want to belittle the person. You don't want to make the person feel bad because they're because they're telling you how they feel. They trusted you with their feelings, right? You don't want to kind of turn it around and just, oh, well, you just, well, sister, you need to believe God. The person is believing God. You just don't. You don't really know how much they have been believing God because it's not your. It's not your fight. You know, it's real easy for us to give advice um, to other people for you know when they're not de when we're dealing with different things, right? Um, it's real easy for me to tell you to get up and exercise when I don't exercise. Okay, it's real easy for me to tell you what to do with your husband, and I'm not married. It's real easy for you know you to tell this person to do on this job. You know, it's just it's just real easy. You have to realize that everybody's struggles is, is different. Everybody's challenge is different. And you know, I thank God. I, I pray that those of you who do not know what it's like to deal with um, suicidal thoughts, or who to be depressed, or clinically depressed, or to have to take medication, or to see a doctor, or whatever the case is, I pray that you never have to find out. Okay, I pray that you never know um, what that's like because for people who have to deal with this, I can tell you it, it's not a um, a good feeling. It's it, it's difficult and it has nothing to do with the spirituality. It has nothing to do whether you believe in Jesus Christ or you don't believe in Jesus Christ. Because according to the scripture, the scripture is clear. What must we do to be saved? The scripture outlines that salvation is different from your physical. What's going on with you physically? Now, does spiritually does there is there an impact? Can you can be ill? and then spiritually be down at the same time, sure. But when we talk about physical illness, whether it's menstrual cramps, whether it's, um, what do you call what people have, anemia but the real bad headaches, or um, whatever the physical illness is, that's in your body. What, this is what we're talking about here. We're talking about mental illness that impact in your body. We're talking about brain illnesses. We're not talking about spiritual illnesses right, right now. But, but again, if you're concerned about a person, you see there's some changes, please ask them. Please ask them what's going on, okay? Um, and they may not be able, you know, they may not tell you at first, which is why you want to start the conversation off by saying, hey, this is what I'm noticing. I'm noticing A, B, C, or D. I'm noticing that you're not as talkative as you used to. Hey, I'm noticing, hey, I used to, you know, I used to hear from you all the time. I haven't heard from you. I mean, I'm noticing, you know, that, you know, when I call you, you're not, you know, you're not calling me back. Are you okay? Have the conversation with the individual. And then you want to, and if they say, no, I'm fine, okay, then you want to follow it up and say, great, because I'm, you know, like I said, I'm noticing you're not eating well. You seem to be losing weight. I'm here if you want to talk about it. Okay, and you want to kind of open the door, and they may not want to have the conversation right then, but they may want to do it later on. So you want to have the door open, keep the door open for them. Okay, but if a person is actively suicidal, and they say, "Yeah," you want to start having a conversation about how they're going to do it. Okay, how would you kill your die by suicide? How would you kill yourself? Do you have the um, the means to do it. You know, you want to kind of try to get a feel for how imminent is the threat. So if a person says, yeah, you know, I just think about, yeah, I'm going to kill myself. I'm thinking about going to California and then jumping off the bridge. Well, if they live in New York and how you, they have no way to get to California, that's probably not going to happen right now. Because many times what people are feeling right in that middle, 
uh, you know, right, not called like a circle, right in that minute. Because when they, all they can see when they have those, um, their visions on, is what's not going right, how they're feeling at the moment, okay? Because, like I said, thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are connected. So they look at, it, 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 things just trigger. It's just trigger. Because remember what I said about clinical depression, a person can hit the lottery for a million dollars, or somebody can give them two million dollars, and they will still be depressed. Okay, so when you in that situation, it's not the event, right? And the uh, event may add on to it, but it's not the event itself. It's the thoughts that go along with that. It's the feeling. It's the changes in the chemicals in the body all coming together. So when you talk about a person being um, depressed, and you're asking them, or well, not necessarily depressed, but you ask them, hey, this is what I'm noticing about you, and then you start having that conversation with them, and let's say, for example, they are depressed, and you, you having that conversation, just know that depression is not a thing, clinical depression is not a thing you would clinically stamp out of it. If you could, then you're not clinically depressed, okay? Uh, when we talk about clinical depression, we're talking about people who it doesn't matter necessarily what's going on around them. There are many people who are clinically depressed who will have enough strength to get up in the morning, go to work, uh, and you may not ever realize it, oh, how are you, how are you? And as soon as they get home, they just had enough strength to make it through the day. They go home, they're in bed. They're in bed, they're, they're just out of it, right? And they're not particularly tired, it's just the clinical depression. So kind of keep that in mind. But going back to when you're um, talking to someone about suicide, are you thinking about killing yourself? Uh, they might say yes, okay. Then we're going to have a conversation of concern about how you would do it, okay. Do they have access to do it? If they're saying, you know, I have my gun is in my room and I think I'm just going to get it and I'm just going to kill myself, right? So you want to have that conversation. You may need to move it, the weapons away. You, know, you may need to call someone. Here's the thing. If you don't feel comfortable, okay, if they say yes and my gun is here and my pills are here, if you don't feel comfortable in doing anything, then make the call. Call 911 or call someone else, okay? Um, but whatever you do, don't leave the person um, don't leave the person alone. Don't leave the person um, without any help. Because here's the thing, if you're going to ask the person how they're doing, you know, you're going to go to the person and say, hey, this is what I'm noticing, at least be, have enough time. Don't do it if you're in a hurry. Don't do it if you're afraid of what they might say. Okay? If you're afraid, you don't want to get involved, but you think that something's going on, ask someone else to do it. Hey, I, you know, Jack, Shane, I am noticed something going on with John. You know, I'm not comfortable with that. You think maybe you can talk to him or maybe you and I can go together. At least you're not leaving the person alone. At least you're not leaving the person without, a, um, without any type of help, okay? I wanted to share, I can do that going along, okay? So just kind of keep that in mind when we talk about death by suicide. Suicide is, in that moment, that's how people feel, okay? Um, so let me kind of read some more stuff here. Like I said, don't leave the person alone. Call 911 and tell them your loved one is actively suicidal and immediate risk of physical harm and or death. That's what you want to call. And this is the case of a person is um, imminently suicidal. If your lo a loved one is not active, meaning they're just kind of thinking about it, because sometimes a person may say, yeah, I'm thinking about killing myself, but I would never do it. Well, excuse me, I would never do it. And then you have the conversation, and you find out why they're feeling that way. And they might fe be feeling this way because, hey, my, something definite. You know, um, it, the Cowboys lost, and I would spend all my money on that the cow Cowboys would win. And you might find out what, what's going on with the person, and you may be able to make, help them make some changes there. But if a person is suicidal, um, and you're concerned about it, and if they're okay, with, comfortable with you getting them to the emergency room, going with them, helping them get to the emergency room, then it's fine. But if they're actively suicidal, or if you're not comfortable, then of course, please call 911. You're going to make sure you remove any uh, firearms, weapons, or anything like that out of the house. Um, and you want to make a call. If you don't know what to do, there is a number. If you put in um, suicide hotline in your uh, web browser or on your phone, the number will come up. But the number is 1-800-273-TALK and a suicide prevention lifeline. And it's not just for person, people who are actively suicidal. It's also good for people if you have a question or any other type of mental health um, concern, they can help you with that as well. 
But remember that number, 1-800-273-TALK. But again, like I said, um, you can put the number you know, in your phone, just type in help for suicide, and more than likely it will come up. So let's talk about some of the myths, and I think I talked about one. Myth, asking someone if they are suicidal may put the idea in their head. That is not true, like I said before. Um, number two, a mention of suicide is not serious enough to require help. When a fact, that's a myth. When a friend or family member has thoughts of suicide, take their words seriously. A lot of times you may have these people, or you might feel, oh, they're just drama queens, they're just doing that to get attention. When someone talks about hurting themselves, this is a warning sign to act and help them. Right? Um, it's not up to us to determine what type of help that they need. They, you know, they, you, you might be pretty sure that they're just saying it's for attention, but it's, re it's better to um, err on the side of caution. Treatments don't work. Treatments do work. Okay? Um, people attempt suicide to gain sympathy. Again, a suicide attempt needs to be taken seriously. If it's not an attempt to gain sympathy from others, but rather demonstrating significant distress and despair about life. So, let's say they are doing that to get attention. Is that a helpful or a helpful way to do, to, to do that? You know that it's not. So it's something that's going on with them, so there's some help that they would definitely need either way. Um, like I said, risk factors pay attention to. Certain risk factors. Prior suicide attempt, like I said before, mental disorders, especially depression, family history of suicide, um, chronic physical illness. A lot of times when a person is chronically ill, again, you're talking about resources, physical resources being depleted, social isolation, loneliness, or hopelessness. The problem with these ones right here, let me read it, social isolation, loneliness or hopelessness, and feeling a burden to others. Social isolation, when you're alone, you know, it's good to be alone sometimes, but when you're alone, you don't have anybody to challenge your thoughts. When you're always alone, you're thinking you, you're the god of your own thoughts. You, whatever you think, you think it's true. You know, uh, we think and we start adding things to our thoughts and, you know, we just, whatever we think, we think is true, okay? And that's not always the case. Sometimes our thoughts are emanating from our pain. Sometimes our thoughts are coming from those negative thoughts, feelings, and behaviors or those unhelpful thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Some people are really critical of others and that when you're, they, they take in those thoughts as well. So if you're a person, the scripture says to the pure, all things are pure. But when you're a person who by nature is a critical person, um, when you mix that in with negative thoughts, it can be re a really bad combination. Social isolation, loneliness can amplify that. Because like I said before, you don't have anyone to challenge those negative thoughts. Okay, Hopelessness and feeling a burden to others. One of the reasons why many people kill themselves or die by suicide is because they feel like they are a burden to others. They feel like they're better off alone. I mean, uh, better off. That we're better off without them. They don't feel like they have anything to add to the world. And when you talk to them, you're looking at them like, of course you wouldn't say this, but you're thinking to yourself, man, come on, you have so much to offer. But keep in mind, when you're de clinically depressed, and those chemicals, we don't understand just how biologically we're made up and how when certain things in our bodies are, is off, how it can impact the entire body. So when a person is not feeling well, well biologically, thoughts, all type, and you're not feeling well, thoughts come in. Um, can come in negative thoughts. And there's a real tendency for us to think negative. Thoughts, feelings, behaviors go together. So you, you try to call someone, they don't pick up the phone, you're thinking, oh, uh, they're probably there and they just don't want to call me back. And then the next thought is, uh, nobody ever want to call me back. Then the next thought is, well, people just don't like me. And then the next thought is, uh, well, maybe, you know, I don't care if they don't like me or not. And you start hyping yourself up to thinking people don't like you. And then the next thought is, well, nobody ever did like me. Then you start, you go into the grocery store. And then somebody, you know, cut in front of you. And then you're like, see, <coughs> people don't like me. They hate me so bad that they cut in front of the... the this, the uh, <coughs> cut me off. <coughs> I'm so sorry. I don't know what's going on. They cut me off in front of the um, where I'm trying to get my, my my buggy. So again, this is how negative thoughts go. They're, they 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 are irrational thoughts. 
Um, there are thoughts that literally don't make sense, but when you're by yourself physically, when you're by yourself um, psychologically, meaning you don't have anybody there to challenge your thoughts, things go to one thing from another. I always like to say, if you can carry a tape recorder around with you, <coughs> that's all of us, a tape recorder for 30 days, and then at the end of 30 days, listen to your tape recorder. You will be surprised what's on your tape recorder. You will be surprised some of the things that we say to ourselves, um, some of the things that we think, some of the ways that we behave. And then when you listen to those things, you realize it's no wonder things are that we behave the way we behave. We're behaving in the way that we think. So kind of keep that, that in mind. But hopelessness is so important. I want to pause here to let people know that you can all make hope an option. Hope is always an option. You've made it through the day, okay? You're home now, and you're thinking you don't know how you're going to make it. You don't know if you're going to get up the next morning. Um, the fact that you're able to get up in the next morning, and I know it's difficult. I understand it's challenging. I understand that when you go home on Friday, you and your bed uh, until Saturday, until Monday morning, I understand that you know you may not take showers, you may not feel like eating, you may not feel like sleeping, that you're crying all the time, that you're irritable. I, I get it, and I understand how difficult and how challenging that that it is, and I understand that it's taking everything and all you ha that's that's all you have in you. What I'm saying to you is that if you spent this this long dealing with that, you owe it to yourself to give yourself another chance. One of the things our motto here is not just providing information and support, but we believe that everyone has a God-given purpose for living. And unfortunately, things that are coming up in our life that make us feel like we don't have a God-given purpose for living, that have gotten in the way. God created you with a wonderful purpose. That's just not something, you know, that we're saying. We believe it, right? All things were created for Him, by His, for His pleasure, for His glory. You're created for His pleasure. Thoughts, feelings, negative thoughts, feelings, events, situations come in our lives to kind of block that and make us feel like we're not lovable. Whether it's physical abuse, whether it's sexual abuse. You know, some people I'm talking to, you may have been sexually abused, you know, as long as you can remember. <clears throat> You've been sexually abused. You're physically abused. You know, all of these things that have been happening to you and you're feeling like it's hopeless. What's, what's the use? Well, I'm letting you know that if you come this far, Right? that you can make it, that you, you, you are making it. It's not that you can make it. You don't need it for me to tell you that you can make it, right? You are making it. You just got to realize it. You Day by day, second by second, some of you, minute by minute, you're making it, right? You don't know how, but you're making it. You don't know how you're getting on the job. You don't know how you're getting up um, in the morning. You don't know how you've taken the shower. You know, you don't even know how you're driving to work. You're getting on the, the plane. Some of you are uh, preaching, teaching. Some of you, you know, doing your work. It takes a lot, and I understand that. But I want you to know that hope is available. Hope is always an, an option. And here's the thing about hope. You don't have to impress anybody. You don't have to, this is not a competition, you know, because again, you have other people on the other side who, I didn't have my little thing up, who don't, don't even know what this is like, okay? Um, so their views may be a little different. They think, this is, this why are you guys going through this, right? This should be so easy, okay? Forget about them, okay? I want you to understand that you have a God who loves you and will meet you right where you are. You can never be so depressed. You can never be so, um, have thoughts of killing yourself. You can never be so anxious. You can never be so, um, whatever you want to fill in the blank, that God is not on your side. He's for you just like he's for the person who's never been depressed. He's for you just like for the person who's never been clinically uh, depressed. He's for you, okay? You have people who think, you know, people should snap out of it. Uh, I don't know why people think that, you know, they these people are not sick or whatever the case is. That's fine. That's fine. You know, I don't have any... Um, <clears throat> thing to say to them. People believe how they believe and that's fine. But I want you to know because there are plenty of people who in the church for example, who you feel this way. You know what it feels like to, you know, to want to go and kill yourself. And you know what it is. And you, and you feel the guilt that comes your way from your brothers and sisters. You know, like, well, if you were saved, if, you know, if you just 
um, prayed, if you just fasted, if you did all these types of stuff, then you would be better. And they don't understand that you are praying, that you are fasting, that you are repenting, that there is no unresolved sin in your life per se. You know, you, you, you just like they are, but you're still dealing with this. Keep in mind, um, we have a class that's coming up, and I don't want to kind of get in, uh, ahead of myself, but we talk about um, uh, this particular topic. Keep in mind that there are some people who are going to be healed instantly, some people are going to be healed uh, per the scripture as they go, and then there are some people who are going to, will not be healed on this side, but, and that's per Bible. And you can talk about Paul is the most notable person with that. So, but whatever category you find yourself in, understand that you have a God that loves you, and because of him there's always hope. You don't have to, you may not feel like it's hope, you may not think Hope, hopeful thoughts. Just keep going. Just keep whatever you're doing to keep going. Just know that there's hope because God is on your side. Okay, let me go through this. Um, what did I say? Social isolation, loneliness, or hopelessness, and feeling a burden to others. These are big things. So for those of you, when you were approaching someone and you asking them, say, hey, I'm noticing this A, B, or C about you. How are you doing? And they tell you that they're feeling suicidal, or they may say, I'm feeling kind of down. And you ask them. Because you're not waiting for them to tell you, you're asking, um, are you thinking about killing yourself? And they may say, no, not really, but you know, I have been having thoughts. And, you, and then start talking to them. Keep this in the back of your mind. When you're talking to someone, when you talk about that, listen for hopelessness. Listen for feeling like they, they feel like they're a burden to others. And then that will kind of tell you which direction that you want to go. Um, impulsive, reckless tendencies and aggressive or violent behaviors, loss and major events. Um, when you know other people have killed the, the themselves, because once other people do it, it kind of, um, like I said, it acts as a trigger. <coughs> Recognizing some warning signs, posting distressing messages on social media sometime, um, dramatic mood shifts, and talking about being a burden to others, again, acting reckless for us increased use of alcohol and or drugs, sleeping too little or too much, again the key has changed. Um, withdrawing for fr friends, family, and society. Um, when you talk about a youth, for example, let me add this here. They may have a peer or friend who has died by suicide. Um, they have suffered a recent humiliation, like they might be being bullied, a breakup. <coughs> um, quality of schoolwork is decreasing. Again, the key is change. Any type of change is a, um, a trigger for you to kind of start asking some questions, okay? Um, like I said before, ask questions. Talk openly and honestly about suicide and don't be afraid to use the word. You know, Don't be afraid to ask. Ask the person. Because help them to feel understood. And when you ask, listen. You know, some people, some of you guys talk too much. You ask the person how they're feeling and then you tell them how you're feeling and then you just keep going on and on. Ask the person, okay, and then listen. Okay, and ask open-ended questions. Give them an opportunity, you know. And if you kind of suspect they may be, it's okay to say, you know, hey, um, <clears throat> they may say no. So okay, that's you know, I'm glad to hear that because I know sometimes people in that situ blah 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 situation, or it's not uncommon to have thoughts of suicide. Um, thoughts of suicide may come to many of us, but there are other things that we can do. We don't necessarily have to act on it. You know, you want to have that conversation with them. You want to be there to support the person and not necessarily judge them. Okay, um, and you you want to kind of talk to have a again have a conversation <coughs> and get them connected w with care. Okay, um, that that's so important. One of the things that you want to do, let's say after your loved one, um, the crisis is abated and gone through. You know you, they've gone through treatment, and treatment for some people may include medications or it may not. It may include speaking to someone. Um, that person could be somebody in the um, their a chaplain. It can be a, a pastor. It can be a uh, a friend, <coughs> or it could be a mental health person, a therapist, or a substance abuse counselor, or anybody like that. Whoever is trained to ask the question, just making sure that whoever you are is that you not, one you ask the question directly that you don't act like you're afraid to ask the question mm -hmm. that you don't give all so much advice that you don't really listen right again this is not about advice giving you want to find out what's going on with them you want to start off um, and you know you want to be supportive you want to start off by asking them this is what I'm noticing about you um, these w what's going on and just kind of asking them those questions okay um, I want to stop here 
Actually, I'm not going to stop the tape. I'm just going to talk about the spirit <coughs> of heaviness. I want to talk about that for a minute. Um, also, but let me stop here and just say, if you got, if that people can log on to our um, YouTube channel and like and subscribe, that that, that that's good for us. That. We want people. I'm trying to build our YouTube channel and also go on to our website. We have a lot of couple things coming up. We have a mental health first aid class. Then we have a faith based um, uh, mental health class. And then we also have um, recently launched a um, an information and support line that is not tw it is not 24 hours seven days a week. It's very specific times, but you can call. We'll pray for you or with you. Myself and I have some other partners that, that help me with this. Um, and also kind of help you or try to assist you, put points in the right direction as far as getting some information. Uh, again, log on to our website, igbatt.com. And then on our website, there is um, ways that you can donate. And donate is not necessarily, you know, you're giving us money, though know, we appreciate that. But there are ways where if you can go and just buy certain items that you buy already, it would help us out, okay? Um, that that, well, that will be helpful. So, again, um, yeah, please, igbatt.com, igbattmho.org. Let me talk about the spirit of heaviness. Because this is sometimes um, <coughs> that people... I'm not going to say get confused about, but again, because things look so similar, um, people sometimes think that it's a physical attack, I mean a spiritual attack, when it's not a spiritual attack, it's a physical, it's physical, or sometimes we get it mixed up. Um, when we talk about a spirit of heaviness, we are talking about just that. When you could do, look through the scriptures, when you look through the Bible, for those of you who are um, who, who do do that, again, this is a faith-based program. From Genesis to Revelation, you'll see when if it's spiritual, it will, it says so. If it's physical, it also says so. Okay, so you're able to kind of um, figure out kind of what what it is. But what we do, we tend to think everything just because it's a mental illness that automatically we want to put it in the spiritual category and that's not the case. You know, I think the scripture when we talk about we take the scriptures when you talk about the, the thoughts and we we don't understand or, or, or not really I don't know what I'm saying forgive me, say what people don't understand, but we just got to be aware that when we're talking about spirit, um, mental illness, we're talking about physical illnesses, we're talking about physical health. We're not talking about spiritual spirituality, um, spiritual health, okay? Um, when we talk about why do people get a mental illness, what are some causes of mental illness, it depends on the mental illness itself, but we know there's, one, there's not one particular cause. There's usually a combination of biological, psychological and social cultural factors all coming together depending on what the mental illness is, right? You don't want PTSD. Okay, we know PTSD is a, is a result of, of trauma. When we look at uh, schizophrenia, bipolar, for example, we know there's a definite changes in the chemicals. So again, it just kind of just varies with the illness, right? But I wanted to um, talk about the spirit of heaviness, okay? But Let me share briefly about de clinical depression. Clinical depression, major depression disorder lasts for at least two weeks and affects a person's emotions, thinking, behavior, and physical well-being. Ability to work and have satisfying relationships, ability to carry out usual daily activities. It is the severity of the symptoms, duration, and impact that classifies symptoms as a disorder. So when we talk about a disorder, it has to meet certain criteria. Like I said before, it's a difference between sadness. It meets, has to meet certain criteria. It impacts our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, um, how we interact with others, how we feel about others. All um, are impacted when we talk about clinical um, depression. When you look at a person who is depressed, you're going to see changes in the emotions, thoughts, behaviors, and physical. Okay, some kind of physical change, for example, you'll see fatigue, lack of energy, weight loss or gain, headaches, um, loss of sexual desire, loss of motivation. You'll see crying spells, 
um, loss of interest and in personal appearance. These are just some of the physical things that, physical behavioral things that you'll see. Um, constipation. Okay. Moving on, you'll see um, again sadness, anxiety. Again, remember I said sadness. Um, we all get sad, okay? We all get quote unquote depressed. But when we talk about clinical depression, we're talking about a, di a diagnosable disorder. Sadness can be part of depression. Sadness is part of clinical depression because it's one of the symptoms, but it's not the only symptom, okay? So a person can be sad and not um, have changes in their sleep or uh, be anxious, okay? Again, when we talk about depression, some signs and symptoms, anxiety, guilt. Mood swings, lack of emotional responsiveness. They're just like, like flat. Um, feelings of helplessness, hopelessness. You can't really think. You can't really bring things together. Um, Self-criticism. Um, pessimism, which to me is just a, a real big one. But pessimism, impaired memory and concentration. Indecisiveness and confusion. Like the, you, just, you, know, just don't, you just don't know. Okay? Um, tendency to believe others see ones in a negative light. Thoughts of death and suicide. So again, death and suicide are can be symptoms of depression. But as we said before, a person can be have thoughts of killing themselves and not necessarily be depressed, clinically depressed. Even though we know that 50% of the time that is the case. Okay. Um, so let me back up here again. When we're talking about clinical depression, we're talking about some symptoms, signs and symptoms that impact a person's emotions, thoughts, behaviors, and feelings last at least two weeks, okay? We're talking about changes in a person's physical fatigue, lack of energy, sleeping too much or too little, overeating, constipation, weight loss, changes in menstrual cycle, headaches, um, loss of sexual desire, we're talking about some crying spells. The withdrawing from others. Neglect of responsibilities. You used to like doing certain things, you no longer like doing them. Loss of interest in personal appearance. Loss of motivation. Slow movement. You know, you just start moving slowly. Use of drugs and alcohol. Um, use of food. Okay? Because um, now you're just kind of just numbing whatever's going on with you. You just kind of feel like you're on autopilot. Sadness. Anxiety. Guilt. Mood swings. As I said before, Feelings of helplessness, hopelessness, irritability, uh, self-criticism, feeling like everybody sees you in a negative light, thoughts of death and suicide. So when we're talking about clinical depression, we're talking about depressive disorders that meet certain criteria. Just like you, in order to be diagnosed with hypertension, you have to meet certain criteria, right? In order to be diagnosed with a heart disease, you have to meet certain criteria. It's the same thing for a mental disorder in particular we're talking about here is depression. But let me talk about the spirit of heaviness just briefly. Okay. The spirit of heaviness and again because when you, when you look at the, the symptoms of a diagnosable disorder, um, <coughs> a physical disorder, they look like they can also be spiritual and sometimes they can be, they can be an overlap but you have, it's important to determine whether this is emanating from the spiritual realm or it's emanating from the physical realm. Because I say to you, for those of you who believe it's all spiritual, then that should be an easy fix for you. Because you can take your spirituality and help the other person and heal them just like that. Um, but when we talk about physical, when it's in the physical realm, you're talking about there's some things that have to be done physically. Okay, biologically, there's some things that's going on with the individual that in their lives. So it's not just spiritually. Even though when a person, you know, I like to say, what is that? Don't kick a person when they're down. Sometimes when you're feeling down physically, spiritually, the enemy, okay, will come in uh, and, uh, and kind of kick you when you're down. You're already feeling down um, spiritually. I mean, physically, and then now the negative thoughts can kind of. Um, lead into your spirituality. But now what I'm talking about now, I'm separating them. I'm just talking about the spirit of heaviness. A person who's clinically depressed may not have a spirit of heaviness, okay? Spirit of heaviness, this is just for you people who are, for us who believe this, okay? The spirit of heaviness, and I'm reading this from the Christianity.com, is an intense negative feeling that challenges our faith and what we know about God. Heaviness may result from our own habitual sins, 
like addiction, lying, and gossip, or could also occur from the loss of a job or even a loved one. To feel heavy is to be burdened, and to be burdened is not is to not carry the light and easy yoke of Jesus. So when we talk about spiritual heaviness, we're talking about a burden. You can have be physically sick and be a sinner, or you can be physically sick and be a sinner. I mean, yeah, and be a saint. Okay, physical sickness will find whoever it, it, it finds. Okay, um, there are plenty of good people, and, and I think this pandemic. Um, kind of showed the people a lot of things, right? A lot of people who love Jesus who died, okay? We're all going to die, okay? We're going to die from something or some of us will go natural causes. But the bottom line is, you know, these bodies do wear down and we do um, we, we do die. Um, that, that happens. But when we talk about spiritual heaviness, this is where, you know, you people, uh, people like to say, oh, the spiritual heaviness for the garment of praise, okay? When you talk about when it's a spiritual problem, then you're looking at a spiritual uh, answer. Okay, when there's a spiritual problem, you're looking at a spiritual strategy, a spiritual technique. Okay, spiritual. When you talk about heaviness, again, should not. Don't confuse it. Don't confuse the two, because if you confuse the two, you're gonna be, you're gonna use the wrong strategies and wrong techniques. Not saying. Let me say this. We know the presence of the power of God is able to heal. He can heal diabetes just like that, hypertension. He can heal you from cancer just like that. He can heal you from a mental disorder just like that. To include depression, he can do do that. I'm not negating that. He heals in so many different ways through the power of some people heal through the word. Some people are healed through laying on their hands. Some people are healed through um, through oil. Some people are healed through, um, like I said, instantly in, um, as they go, and then on the other side. So. This channel here, we believe that God can heal. That's, that's not an, an argument, right? Um, that God God can heal, um, but it, we also believe it's His timing and it's His way, okay? we Our job is to apply the scripture, to apply the remedy, and then trust Him for the outcome. We have to trust Him that He knows what He's doing. We trust Him that once we bring our cares and concerns to Him, that we trust Him. Because here's the thing, if being sick... Okay, being physically sick had anything to do with your salvation, then you wouldn't be sick. That has nothing, you being physically sick, and physical sickness could be um, whether it's a mental illness, whether it's diabetes, hypertension, um, cancer, you know, um, a cold, whatever your disease is, or your disease, illness, whatever it is, overweight, whatever it is. If that, those things were that important, okay, um, then you would not be, we would not be sick, okay? Being, ha salvation has to do with believing Jesus Christ. He makes it real simple. He doesn't say, believe, um, confess, and don't be sick. He doesn't say that if you have a um, diabetes, you can't be saved. He doesn't say that if you have a mental illness that you can't be saved, or that if you have hypertension, or that if you get COVID that you can't be saved. He doesn't say that, okay? This is a faith walk. This is a trust in him. The thing is, some people get to in, um, this argument or this thing back and forth. Well, you know, who sinned? Why is this person sin? And that's what they said in the Bible. Um, they, they, uh, and I don't want to get into that uh, right now. But the, um, ap the apostle said to Jesus, you know, who did sin? Was it him or his parents? And Jesus said, neither. Okay? It's not about sinning. That this, was, this miracle, this sickness is as a, it's for a reason. Okay, but we get into this thing is if you're sick, you don't love Jesus, um, or you're not saved, or you're not um, you you got unconfessed sin, or you or you you know you're not reading your word, you're not fasting or whatever. And then if you are sick, well, yeah, the bottom line is the two camps. One camp feels that the only people who get sick, right? I'm saying that right, are the people who either a not saved or weak in the faith, or people who don't believe Jesus, people who don't fast who don't pray, who have unconfessed sin, okay? Those are the works people because we, we are saved through grace. We're saved through uh, faith. What I'm saying to people, because I, I, I understand both sides, okay? Now, do we need to pray fast, confess our sins? Yes. We should be confessing our sins. Can unresolved sin um, bring on sickness? It sure can because when we look into the scripture, we can see it scripturally, okay? That unresolved sin 
unrepentance or non-repentance can bring about sickness. But is that always the case per the scripture? No, it is not always the case. Because you look at, like I said, Paul, for example, and there are others, but I just, that's the one that came through on my mind, prayed, fasted, didn't have any unconfessed sin, but he had a sin, that, not sin, he had an illness that he died with. Some of us are going to have illnesses that we die with. That's just, I mean, I don't know how else to say it, but biblically, that's kind of where we are, right? Uh, you can see it scripturally. You don't have to argue with me. You can look at it um, scripturally. So again, keep in mind when we talk about the spirit of heaviness, it's a little different. Spirit of heaviness, you want to repent from your sin. You want to make sure that you're saved. You want to make sure you're praying, you're reading your word, you're fasting, that you're in line with the word of God. And once you're spiritually in right standing, then you have an obligation, then you have um, a chance to, to, you can pray and fast, you can, um, uh, what do you call it, praise the Lord, you know, replace that spirit of heaviness with the spirit of joy, but there's no need for you praising God and worshiping Him if you're in sin. So that's what you have to do for a spiritual, but a spirit of heaviness. When you're talking about a physical illness, you need to make sure that you take care of the spirit of heaviness as well, that you're praying, fasting, you're right standing with the Lord, and that you um, confess sins, and you don't have any unre you know, unrepentant sins, but also you have to make sure that what do I need to do here? What is the other strategy? You have to consult the Lord. Okay, do I need to take medication? Do I need to see a doctor? Do I need to talk to someone? Do I need to cut back on food? Do I need to exercise? Whatever the strategy is, you need to do that. Spiritual situation, uh, illness, spiritual strategy. Physical illness, biologically based, needs a biologically based physical strategy along with the spiritual um, aspect. Because we never leave Jesus Christ out. In all things we do, in, in whatever it is, word or deed, we do it all in the name of Jesus Christ. Again, this is It's Getting Better All the Time Mental Health Outreach. Log on to our website at igbatt.com. Again, please log on. Um, uh, what do you call it? Click and um, sign up for our uh, Facebook. Um, we're trying to grow that. We're eventually going to have a um, start a Facebook group. We don't have one now, but please log on to that. I'm sorry. I mean YouTube, not Facebook. YouTube. I don't really do. We don't really do you Facebook that much. But um, please log on to our YouTube channel and. Log on to our website, igbatt.com. Click on the way that you can support us. Again, donations are always great, but you don't have to donate. We have things that we're, we're selling. We're trying to, uh, we have an online store. We have other ways that you can support us and actually get something in return. Um, even if, but if you donate, we're a 501c3, so you're able to get a, um, you know, a tax write-off. But again, it's getting better all the time. Mental Health Outreach, igbatt.com. You can write us at Post Office Box 7432, Silver Spring, Maryland, 20910. Email igbatt, the number one, at aol.com. God bless you.